Well, next I'd like to um, invite Rob Norman to the stage and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, three major issues tonight and, and the first one is going to be Rob's and he's going to be talking, um, well, I'll let him introduce his topic. Uh, Rob is the State Director of ACL in Queensland. Come on up, Rob. Well, it's good to be here, guys. Um, as you probably know, things have been a little bit busy around the ACL lately. Um, we have an election coming. And can I just respond to Dave? It's actually been really easy to have unity with Dave. He and I spent nearly two weeks in the car together between here and Townsville. So I had no choice for a start. He had no choice. We were locked in the car. And um, we visited a bunch of towns between here and Townsville and on the way back, um, which was a heap of fun. And we spoke to audiences that weren't as nice as you, Mob. So it's great to be here. I want to talk about, um, obviously, religious freedom, and it is indispensable. So firstly, we need to remember religious freedom isn't something that's given to you. It's something that God gave you, and it belongs to you. And the moment we take a defensive position, we're in trouble. So the bottom line is religious freedoms, when they're suppressed by governments, they allow governments to control and manipulate belief systems for their own purposes. Now, I believe we're in a cycle where we're seeing that play out in our time. And as we succumb to ever-tightening controls over freedoms of speech and expression of religion, we end up with what we deserve. We end up with a tyrannical government system that rules every part of our life, a.k.a. Marxism. And so we're heading in that direction, and by doing nothing, we actually allow that to happen. And so protecting religious freedoms is essential to guarding against authoritarianism and upholding the broader democratic freedoms of speech and assembly and association. Those things are bedrock to society. Every person in the world, and particularly in the Western secular world, has the right to freedom of speech. And we deserve that right because that's really what democracy says. And so protecting religious freedoms is essential to guarding against those things. And although I don't have time to unpack this part of it, it's actually um, the church is a gift to the political world. And without the church's voice in the world, we would be far worse off. We know that's true. History shows us that. We, uh, the church has been responsible for starting charities, for people like um, Wilberforce who reformed slavery. I mean, that guy was 47 years in the business of reforming slavery. And incredibly, he actually passed away a week before slavery was completely abolished in the UK. So he devoted his whole life to doing it. The church has its voice and we need to maintain our voice. But I want to bring our focus back to Queensland and particularly the election on the 26th of October. Let me say this, although governments introduce bills and create legislation, let's remember that it's God who gives freedom. So Galatians 5.1 says... It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm them and then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What God has given, no other person can take away. Now, fortunately, true freedom isn't given by the governments, but by God. Here's the kicker. And there's always a kicker. It needs us to be people that are brave because the kicker is, that true freedom can lead to incarceration, persecution, and even death. And centuries of Christian martyrs attest to that fact. That's not the most popular part of my talk, I've got to say. Nobody signed up for that. But that's the reality of it. In fact, that word martyr comes from the Greek, a Greek word that means witness, is translated witness in the New Testament. So we're called to witness the presence of Christ on, on this earth. And that witness that we bring could cost us our life. So what I want to do, I want to very quickly move into um, Queensland anti-discrimination law because you've probably heard that there's a bill that's just been passed and happened on Tuesday this week. This has been the last sitting week of Parliament. So the bill's called the Respect at Work and Other Matters Amendment Bill of 2024. It's basically another one of these omnibus bills. They, don't, they run out of words, so it becomes a word salad and they throw everything into it that they haven't done in their term in Parliament. And so what we've seen is a tired government that's had an agenda 
to gag the church, basically coming to a point now where they've thrown it all into this one bill that modifies the Anti-Discrimination Act. To understand what's going on here, we need to understand a little bit about the Queensland Human Rights Commission. And firstly, let's say this. The Queensland Human Rights Commission was formed on the 1st of July 2019. It was established under the Human Rights Act of 2019, which was passed by Queensland Parliament on February uh, 2019. So the Queensland Human Rights Commission replaced the former Anti-Discrimination Commission of Queensland and took on additional responsibilities in rela that related to the protection and promotion of human rights in Queensland. That's their charter. Since its formation, the Q Queensland Human Rights Commission has been given increasing powers to develop and implement human rights legislation, handle complaints regarding possible branches, breaches of legislation, and provide mediation and resolution of complaints regarding breaches of the Anti-Discrimination Act. Now, one of my very good friends at the moment is uh, in deep water with the Queensland Human Rights Commission because he decided a better alternative to a welcome to country was the reading of Psalm 24. Um, so I'm going to just leave it there, but you probably know who that person is. <laughs> Earlier this year, under the direction of the Queensland Labor government, the QHRC developed a draft new anti-discrimination bill. I don't know if you saw that. It's been around for a couple of years, actually. It's been floating around. And um, Labor's plan was to repeal and replace the existing Anti-Discrimination Act with that new bill. Now, largely due to a very well-coordinated campaign by ACL, and I'm, I'm saying that, I'm not boasting, I'm just telling you that's the truth, Queensland heads of churches and and several other legal and advocacy groups, Labor pulled back on, on our main objection to the bill. So our main objection was that they were planning on removing exemptions that allow religious schools to hire staff whose values and beliefs align with that school. So they pulled back on that. And um, everybody was applauding that and saying, phew, we dodged a bullet. And then they came up with this new thing called the uh, Work Respect Bill. Respected Work Bill, which eclipsed the previous bill and then some. So these exemptions are called occupational requirements and they're contained in Section 25. Remember that section, Section 25 of the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Act. Now, when Labor introduced its Respected Work and Other Matters Amendment Bill, and I, if I keep talking like that, I'm going to start speaking in tongues because it's such, it's <laughs> such a large, you know, conflated name... Uh, on June the 14th, it also implemented most of the Commission's previous recommendations. It left Section 25 uh, exemptions intact, um, but that turned out to be a ploy. So it actually, they did that intentionally. It was a ploy to get the churches off their back because the churches had hammered them. There were lots of uh, um, submissions that went into the uh, to the Human Rights Commission, and thank you, many people in this room wrote some of those submissions, and I thank you for that. It did work. But what they've done is that they've created this new thing and introduced two new sections to the Anti-Discrimination Act in 100, Section 124C and D. Now, if you're into um, the internet, you can look those up and check, check my work. I'm not telling you lies. So they introduced those into the bill, and this severely weakened the exemptions of Section 25 and actually made them useless to some extent. So before I move on to the material dangers of the bill, we have to remember that the Queensland Human Rights Commission is an unelected bureaucracy. It is a honeypot for attracting activists and ideologues. And so they're the people that work in the Human Rights Commission. The Queensland Human Rights Commission is largely unaccountable, but its views are cited in parliamentary inquiries as being independent and fair by the government that installed it. So this is the way it works. The new bill, which has been drafted by the Queensland Human Rights Commission, will confer even greater powers on the commission itself. So it's a circular argument. 
the powers that began and were part of the initial charter have multiplied to the point now where the Queensland Human Rights Commission, as of Tuesday, has now become the umpire and the judge of, of uh, anti-discrimination law in Queensland. Let me speak to this bill and give you some, um, some light to help you kind of judge where it's at. So the Respected Work Bill, uh, I'm just going to call it that for now because all the other words become a salad, it was passed into law Tuesday night, this week, shortly after 9 o'clock, 9 p.m., now, this is a long sitting day. Deb and I, that's my wife there, Deb, we were in Parliament at 6 o'clock on Tuesday. We attended the parliamentary prayer breakfast. It was really good. We spoke with some great Christian parliamentarians. And basically, I, I hung around all day and watched the outcomes of this thing. Had meetings with MPs, did some lobbying. Um, there's been a long process leading up to Tuesday. So this was kind of checking in to find out where we're at in terms of a whip count. And what I discovered fairly early in the day is that the LNP would vote against the bill on block, the Catter Party would vote against the bill on block, and the, the Labor Party and the rest of the crossbench, which is the left-leaning Greens, um, would vote for the bill. So what happened is we had 90, uh, sorry, 49 Labor and two Greens MPs who supported the bill, 39 LNP and four Catters who opposed the bill, which meant that it went down 51.39. So the, the, or the bill actually went up. We went down. So I've been directly lobbying all 93 MPs for the last six months on this bill, and they knew exactly what was in it. There were no doubts. I sent them our notes. I sent them um, basically um, opinion from legal people. They knew exactly what they were voting for. It's vitally important, friends, that we reward those who vote well in our parliament and we punish those who do not. I know that sounds anti-Christian, but we're talking here about evil. We have to punish evil. We must not accommodate it. Political promises must be followed up with political actions. It's as simple as that. And so I want to summarise the main threats of this bill. And I want to really, at the same time, encourage us to be brave we really have to be courageous moving forward from here. Um, my hope is that we'll see the bill repealed after 20, 26th of October, but it won't happen in the first week. It won't happen in the first 100 days. It may not happen at all, but we have to fight against it. Firstly, this is what's happening. Sorry, I skipped over that. I'm notoriously bad with PowerPoints. They're really just eye candy. Firstly, the bill broadens the grounds for discrimination to, in, to include a new um, protected attribute called sexual orientation. Now, every time the, the Anti-Discrimination Act is modified, they keep adding protected attributes. So protected attributes are those persons to whom the act is supposedly protecting. Um, so these protected attributes are those categories. And the addition of sexual orientation specifically applies in legal terms to a person's capacity or lack of capacity for emotional, affectional and sexual attraction to or intimate relationships or sexual relationships with a person of a different gender or of the same gender or more than one gender. And that's a quote. So that's a mouthful. So it specifically protects people... Um, that have those sexual orientations. Not just um, that they identify as something, but that they actually act it out. So it's talking about actions, not just um, identification. This is part of an ever-broadening range of protected attributes whom, against whom speech and discussion is being increasingly limited. So it's becoming harder and harder to talk about that even. Because if we're doing that, the next part of the act uh, the new act, will then come and bite us, which basically um, says that if someone is offended by what we say, that there is a potential claim. This is getting really serious. So secondly, the bill imposes a new positive duty, and this affects every employer in the state. So it basically means that all employees, or employers, I should say, must take positive measures to eliminate discrimination based on the respected work bill. 
This means that workplaces, which will include churches and schools, they don't have any exemptions, will need well-developed policies to address diversity, equity and inclusion. DEI, remember those three letters, that acronym, because you're going to hear a lot about them over the coming um, season. And they must have a regime of educating their employees. This includes churches and Christian schools, friends. The bill prohibits what it calls hostile work environments. This is a poorly defined uh, term, but could include a work environment where marriage is viewed to be between a man and a woman entered into for life to the exclusion of all others, which until the end of 2017 was part of the Australian monotum for marriage. And most celebrants, or every civil celebrant, was bound to actually repeat that and, and, and state that before they married the couple. So the bill has created that hostile environment, um, and you can see that that's obviously aimed at religious institutions. But it also applies to employers who believe the same. And so if in your work situation, for instance, you left a manual in the lunchroom or a, a book in the lunchroom that explained that marriage is between a man and a woman, you could, uh, be, you could be dragged before the Human Rights Commission because you've offended the next person in, in the lunchroom as well. The new duty will limit the ability of religious entities to organise internally, in other words, their staff, in a way that corresponds with their beliefs or to recruit and maintain staff in support of a particular ethos that does not fully affirm sexual orientations of all kinds. And this now extends to um, orientation actuated behaviours, as I explained just a while ago, um, or gender identity, which has always been there. So they've increased um, the positive duty uh, and there are no express exemptions for religious institutions or employers under the Act. So as I mentioned earlier, that Section 25 exemption, really it's meaningless. Um, schools and institutions still theoretically have the right to employ people that follow the same faith, but then once they've joined, if there is anything that needs what we would say discipline, you can't do it. It just can't happen. So they can change gender, they can marry whoever they like, and they can um, carry on however they wish. And then thirdly, the bill lowers the threshold for vilification to levels that are unprecedented. This is, without doubt, the worst and most severe anti-discrimination legislation in Australian history, and it's happening right here in the state that we live in. It's a direct attack on freedoms of speech, speech and expression of religion, especially when sharing beliefs or engaging on discussion topics related to any of the protected attributes. Now, here's an example. If anyone preaches or posts a message on social media that sex outside of marriage is a sin and marriage is the exclusive union between a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others entered into for life, they risk being hauled before the Queensland Human Rights Commission, and being prosecuted for, quote, likely, get that word, likely inciting hatred, contempt or ridicule. In fact, the Act has been modified to this. The new Act will no longer, and this is taken straight out of the, um, uh, the explanatory notes to the bill, the new Act will no longer require that a complaint demonstrates that another person actually incited but rather that the public act was likely to incite hatred, contempt or ridicule based on their protected attributes. So you can see the kind of uncertainty that's been introduced. And you can see that the umpire, the Queensland Human Rights Commission, now have the ability to interpret that however they wish. And even if you win the legal case, the cost of lawfare is going through the roof. So currently, the Queensland Human Rights Commission, um, according to their own website, has 55 employees. I'm suspecting that probably within the next two years that will double or triple because I'll need that kind of staff to support the activists who lodge claims, and that, that will happen, mark my words. People say, well, you're being alarmist when you say that, but we warned, we warned people that when the Marriage Act changed in 2017, it would open the floodgates of hell, and that's exactly what has happened. And so I'm not exaggerating when I say that the Queensland Human Rights 
Commission is about to experience a revival. They're going to double or triple their employment base. And then number four, this is the, the last part of it. There's a lot of bad stuff. I've picked out the worst four. Fourthly, the bill confers greater powers to the Queensland Human Rights Commission to investigate and audit businesses, churches and schools. They can enter the business uninvited and do a complete audit. Here is an excerpt from the bill. The bill, quote, includes amendments to the functions and powers of the Queensland Human Rights Commission to provide that the Commission's educational programs may support compliance with the Act, in addition to promoting the purposes of the Act and to explicitly include a power for the Commission to make guidelines. In other words, they will tell you what you must educate your employees to do and say and how to say it. I kid you not, this is serious stuff. So that comes straight from the explanatory notes to the bill. Friends, we need to know that the Queensland Human Rights Commission is uh, complicit in this evil. They designed the bill. It was given to the Labor government who implemented it and the Labor government commissioned them. So there's a circular thing going on here. The new Anti-Discrimination Act will likely see, as I said, this commission double, triple or quadruple in size. So let me summarise. The bill is repressive and it contains no positive right for the freedom of speech or expression of religious belief. In other words, we think that every person should have the right to express their opinion and to declare what they believe in their, um, according to their religious rights. What this means effectively is that the Queensland Human Rights Commission will now have the ability to deem certain theologies that are acceptable to the state and those that are not. Think about that. So they're actually going to interpret those Bible verses that are acceptable. To you and I, the dangers are obvious. Um, and in the next term of parliament, we really have to make sure that things change. So the way we vote and who we vote for is important. Now, we're going to give you some tools. The ACL does this every year. Our website's up and ready to go. I'll give you QR code shortly to scan and follow it through. But in the next term of government, I'm committed to doing this. And I'm not a politician, so I, I've got no need to make these promises. I'm actually ready to retire, but I can't retire now because this is all happening. <laughs> we're going to ask the new government, government to commission a full and transparent public inquiry into the Queensland Human Rights Commission. I would rather just ask them to dump it, but we have to go through that process. That's the first thing we're going to do. Secondly, we're going to ask the government to repeal changes implemented by the Respected Work and Other Matters Amendment Bill. That's the obvious thing, to repeal this thing, get it off the table. And then thirdly, we're going to ask them to introduce a new bill to provide a positive right for religious institutions and religious people. So not just the churches but every person that professes their faith. Now, I want you to know that I've already begun this process. We knew that this wouldn't go well because the current government's uh, track record isn't great. I don't know if you noticed that. I've actually been in seven parliamentary inquiries this year and um, six of the seven have been very negative. We've lost them badly. The seventh was something that Matt Cliff is going to talk about, which is the live birth spill, which I think was an absolute victory and we're... We're on a good path there. And so we've begun the process of talking. The, uh, the Cata Party guys are amazing. They're on board. They're, they're ready to uh, pen legislation or at least put, it, put a bill together. Um, and we're also speaking to the LNP. Now, it's likely, according to the polls, that the LNP will win government. Um, that's likely. We can't assume that. And I, I'm not going to recommend who you should vote for. I think you should look at your local candidates carefully and make really informed decisions. And so to help you do that, we've got a website, and if you want to point your camera there, it'll take you straight to it. Now, friends, this website is loaded with information, and it's being updated weekly. We're updating it right up until the election. As we get closer to the election, it'll probably be daily. Now, what we've got there is information about what we call the big five issues in Queensland which includes the three issues we're speaking about tonight 
as well as a parental rights bill, which we're talking to some of the parties about, and also some legislation to help prostituted persons exit the industry. So that's another bill that went through last year. Um, we're also including information about sitting MPs, how they voted in the past term. You'll have all the voting records. And we've, um, we've sent out questionnaires to all the candidates that we've had at the time, and we'll increase that. And we've had a great number come back from people, some of you that are in the room here today. Um, so that question is important. And we've also included a video explaining how the system works in Queensland. So basically, we have a full preferential voting system. You must number every box or your, num or your vote isn't um, valid. That's basically the bottom line. So guys, can I really uh, ask you to check that website regularly? Right up to the election, do your own homework, pass it on to other people, text it to them, and have them do their homework as well. I believe that we're in a position where we can turn this around. I know it sounds like doom and gloom, but there is hope. There's always hope. Amen. And as long as there's people like you and I in the game, we can still win this thing. So God bless you. Let's do it together. Thanks, guys. What would you like us to ask the candidates in our electorate uh, before we choose our preferences? If it, if it comes down to one question on the issue of um, religious and religious freedom, or actually freedom of speech and freedom of ex expression, the question I would want to ask every candidate is, are you prepared to support a bill that would allow for the positive right of people of faith to express their faith publicly? That's the one question. Um, I think freedom of speech and expression flow from that one question. But that's the most important thing. It's a positive right. It's not just an exemption from discrimination in their language. We have to change the language. It's, a, it's both an education process and a real question. Should someone put a question for you? Uh, who would like to ask a question? We have one. Um, my question is pretty basic. Um, with these new bill that's just been passed, is this going to affect, um, like, Gideon's Bibles, for example, being in motel rooms? That's a good question. So, specifically the just bill... Just repeat the question for the recording. The question for the recording is, will the new bill, and it's re reference to the Respect at Work bill, will that bill affect the distribution of Bibles, such as the Gideon's Bible? Um, to the best of our knowledge, no. So the bill is aimed at speech, it's aimed at uh, spoken words, or um, it's aimed at social media. So if you put a personal view on social media, it would be a, a very large stretch for the bill to prosecute the Gideons because of what the Bible says. I don't think that's going to happen at this stage. Can I ask a supplementary question? Yeah, short one. <laughs> it, just what you said before, Rob, you said something about leaving a book inadvertently, say, in a, a workspace yep. about plan for marriage between men. Great. Marriage. My immediate thought, Excellent follow up. Was the Bible, what if I was to leave inadvertently the Bible? Because it, it very well clearly mm. states that that is the problem. Yeah, at this point in time, it would it, it's a big stretch for that bill to, to then cover, to cover scripture. It could cover a book on scripture, so a commentary which is someone's opinion. Um, but I'm not saying it's not possible. At the end of the day, if it's proven that you left that Bible there strategically for that person to read, uh, yeah, which we all do, <laughs> then, then, then there's, there's nothing off limits. The language is so loose that, there's, that anything is possible, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think this bill is quite that bad yet, but it's really, 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 really bad. <laughs>